In the early days of metagenomic sequencing, we had one sample, and we would maybe sequence it relatively deeply, what we thought was deeply at that time, using, for example, Sanger sequencing or 454 sequencing, and we would try and assemble complete genomes out of that data. In one of the earliest examples of this was the Sargasso C data sets from Craig Venter's group, where they were able to sequence very deeply and assemble a Schuonella genome um, out of their data set. But more recently, instead of just sequencing one sample, the sequencing price has gone down so much, we can now sequence multiple samples. And so, for example, one of the ways that we do this is that we can take an individual and we maybe collect a sample from them. Let's say we're sequencing a fecal sample, and so maybe we'll collect a sample from them um, every day for a week. So we end up with seven different samples from the same person. So the concept is that in these samples, we're very likely to see the same organism over time. So that the organisms that we find on day seven are going to be related to the organisms that were there on day six, to day five, to day four, to day three, to day two, to the first day. Now, obviously, that relatedness depends exactly on how far apart you do those samplings. If you do those samplings every day, then it's a reasonable expectation that you're going to find the same organism in multiple days. But if you do that sampling once a year or once a decade or once every five years or something, then you're much less likely to find the same organism in multiple samples. However, depending on where you're looking, if you're looking at, instead of fecal samples from somebody, if you're looking at a mine sample from a location where the bacteria are not growing very fast, then maybe it's a more reasonable assumption that if you take a sample every year, you can identify organisms. And so the basic idea with binning is that we take these samples and we start by renumbering them. And we renumber them in such a way that we can identify where each read came from. Now, as we'll see a little bit later on, we don't necessarily need to do this renumbering step. It's a little bit optional. Um, but in, the, in some of the original binning steps that we did, um, we had to do this. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to combine all the data into one big assembly. And so we're going to take each of our FASTQ files from day one, day two, day three, day four, and so on. And we're going to mix them together with spades, and we're going to do one big assembly with all of the data set. So we'll have contigs where we have data from sample one, sample two, sample three, and so on. Typically, what we do now is we then map the individual reads back to the assembly. And the reason that we have to do that is that the modern assemblers, like spades, don't keep track of which read contributes to which contig. So basically what we're doing here is we're building contigs out of our metagenomes, and then we're identifying which of the reads from each of these different samples comes back to the contigs that we've built. We count the abundance of each contig, so that's the things that come out of our assembly, in each sample. And so we basically just count abundance. We can normalize it by the length of the contig. We can normalize it by the number of the reads. Um, but basically, we count the, uh, the abundance. And then we plot a graph. And so we plot a graph where we have, on our x-axis, our different samples. So this is the sample from day one, day two, day three, etc. And on our y-axis, we have typically our normalized abundance. And we normalize it based on the length of the contigs. And so what we may find is that for a particular contig, on day one, its abundance is here. On day two, it's a little bit more abundant. On day three, it's even more. On day four, it's much less. That's for one contig. But we repeat that process for all of the contigs. And so maybe there's a contig that 
uh, starts off high on day one, and then is less on day two, is more on day three, even more on day four, goes down on day five, up on day six, and down on day seven. But we keep going. We keep going. And we plot the next contig, and we find that it behaves somewhat similar to the first one that we plotted. And then we plot the next contig, and we find it too looks quite similar to the previous three contigs. And then we plot the next contig, and it too is behaving in a very similar trend. And then we plot the next contig, and it too is behaving the same way. Okay. If we plot the abundance of all of our contigs, what we'll find is there are groups of contigs that behave the same way. Now, there's several explanations for this. Can you think of any? So the simplest explanation, and remember the simplest explanation is always, almost always the right one, the simplest explanation is that all of these contigs are coming from the same genome, the same organism. And in fact, what they represent is here's the genome of a particular bacteria, say this bacteria here, and we've assembled it, but we haven't assembled the whole thing. We've assembled this region, we've assembled this region, we've assembled this region, this region, and so on. And that each of these regions is represented by an independent contig. And our assembly algorithm was confused over some of these gaps. Remember that the assembly algorithms get f confused where you have highly repetitive regions. Maybe these are the 16S genes. Assembly algorithms get confused where you have uneven abundance. Maybe these are IS elements, and so on, okay? And so what we've got is individual contigs, and all of those contigs come from the same genome. And so in this case, we've identified what we call the differential coverage of our contigs. And so this would be called differential coverage binning. But we can also identify relationships between contigs by counting, for example, the frequency that we have different former sequences, and so the tetranucleotide frequency. And if we count the tetranucleotide frequencies across our contigs, it turns out that we can also put contigs together, because usually genomes have quite similar tetranucleotide frequencies across the genome. So there are several different ways that we can get information and combine that information to identify contigs from genomes. And what we found is by doing this, if we pull out all of the reads that contribute just to these contigs, just to these contigs from those days, if we pull out just those reads and put them into their own uh, FASTQ files and take those FASTQ files and run spades on them to do our own assembly, we get much bigger contigs that come out than we had in the first place. Once we remove the background noise of the metagenome, then the assembler is actually much more able to create contigs out of individual uh, reads. So nowadays, there are several robust tools that we use for metagenomic binning. Some of the ones that we use frequently are Concoct, Metabat, Groupum, and of course the one that we developed that we love, which is called Cross Assembly or CRAS. And we use that to identify the CRAS phage.